as a bowl as a camera stand which is uh, quite uh, quite fabricated did you have your uh, meal for the day yes i did yeah i some generous souls uh, helped me have an early meal <laughs> yes very good uh, vegetarian indian cuisine so, and the, the the server actually started speaking french to me so <laughs> I was really impressed. <laughs> this Indian man who's just like just knew French. So that was good. Um, I guess just to put you into a little oh, little context. So um, during I think it was day five of um, of the. I'll just change my view. Ah, there we go. Okay. So day five of the retreat, um, when Delson and I went to the Bodhi tree and uh, had this idea to give a talk on the awakening, I gave uh, the first part, which was how the Buddha went through the Mahasachaka Sutta uh, when he's uh, going through all the austerities with the breath and uh, like even cutting out his breath, not breathing and then uh, cutting out food and then becoming so emaciated and um, he actually after so long of doing that and actually here in Bodh Gaya the cave is really nearby it's eight kilometers from here where he did these six years of austerities and actually we're supposed to go check it out tomorrow and um, so he uh, he came to the conclusion that uh, that was not the way to awakening because he had been doing that for six years and and I also talked about because it is linked to a previous sutta which is the noble search in the Majjhima Nikaya they're both in the Majjhima Nikaya these are the two main suttas that talk about like he really his the kind of breakthrough to awakening and uh, his previous teachers basically uh, Alara Kalama and uh, Udakke Ramaputta so um, these two teachers who brought him all the way to uh, the plane of nothingness and neither perception and non-perception and so but still he was he thought that that doesn't lead to Nibbana that doesn't lead to disenchantment and even though he was asked to be a teacher in those traditions he said no because he wasn't feeling like this was what he was looking for so and then he did the six years of tapas the really harsh austerities and realized this is not the path and um, and then realized he remembered his youth when he was a young child uh, looking at the plowing festival and his father the king was plowing the field and everybody was there and he was just alone under the tree and he actually experienced jhana there for the first time uh, which is just that letting go of all sensory you know worries engagements and then there's this nice clear joy that arises from that and uh, so and there's still some kind of uh, some kind of very wholesome thinking that is possible at that point but uh, very lightly so and that came through a lot with a lot of relief and a lot of joy and then he remembers that and then he says well could that be the way to awakening like why am I afraid of that pleasure why am I afraid of of this 
and so he continues to think and he's like well I'm not afraid of this this is blameless like this this got nothing to do with sensual desires selfishness or anything it's only actually uh, it's it's blameless basically so I'm not gonna go through the whole thing because I, I've already uh, spoken about it and actually this is gonna be day five of the retreat and it's gonna be posted relatively soon so this is meant to be just the sequel to that because Delson's part afterwards um, so basically we took uh, I took the first part and then he took the second part where uh, he wanted to speak about dependent origination so um, I suggested to maybe uh, talk about the beginning of the Mahavaga basically so when he's going through after awakening so uh, basically what uh, his whole realization under like the seven the seven uh, seven following weeks basically under each of the different trees and so this is mainly found in the Mahavaga and um, unfortunately Delson's talk uh, I'm not sure why the the recorder stopped recording I think the the, the data was full in uh, in the card so uh, we don't have that talk but uh, I'll be doing a little bit a little bit of a uh, a sequel to to the the first part that I uh, that I started with and this is the, in the Mahavaga which is in the Vinaya Pitaka and I'm not going to only talk about dependent origination. I'm, it starts with that, but um, it, it flows into all the rest of, um, of the seven weeks after his awakening. And uh, depending on how, <laughs> how the audience feels, <laughs> um, uh, either maybe a touch on the... I was thinking maybe we can include the... the Dhammachakapavatana Sutta or not so basically uh, we'll see but this whole sequence for me um, is kind of like really the, the awakening of the Buddha you know when, he, when he's actually getting enlightened afterwards and what he's going through his realizations and then he goes to teach the first uh, his first students basically and uh, set the wheel of Dhamma rolling I think that's kind of like the summary of everything uh, <laughs> around, around awakening so and I believe I will I'll begin because this is found in the Vinaya Pitika but it's also found in the Udana this is the the opening lines of the Udana and I have a translation on that so I just need to find myself here so can you still see me when I do this cuz uh, yes you can okay still see good <laughs> cuz I can't see you anymore <laughs> I'll uh, try to okay maybe do half a screen good okay so here we are and the Buddha is awakened thus have I heard once the awakened one was living at Uruvela on the bank of the river Naranjara at the root of the tree of awakening just after his complete awakening on that occasion the awakened one sat in one posture for seven days experiencing the bliss of freedom so I always like to kind of underline that he was just like blissing out after awakening that's the first thing he's doing <laughs> just saying <laughs> then when the week had passed he emerged from this samadhi and in the first part of the night paid careful attention to the arising chain of causality when there is this that comes to be when this arises, the arising of that, there is the arising of that. That is, lack of discernment produces mental activity. Mental activities produce consciousness. Consciousness produce mind and body. Mind and body produce the six senses. The six senses produce contact contact produces experience experience produces wanting wanting produces attachment attachment produces a sense of self the sense of self produces renewed existence 
renewed existence produces aging and death and the manifestation of sorrow, sadness, trouble, depression and anxiety. This is how this whole mass of trouble comes into being. Then having understood this, the Awakened One let out this joyful revelation. Surely when the nature of things become clear to the devout meditating Brahmana, at that time all doubts vanish as one understands nature, Dhamma and its cause. And so, on the subsequent uh, moment, uh, then the Awakened One, I have to adjust because it's not exactly the same translation, so. Then the Awakened One sat in one posture for seven days, experiencing the bliss of freedom. Then when the week had passed, he emerged from this samadhi and in the second part of the night paid careful attention to the regressing chain of causality. So basically the progressive chain is how the first two noble truths arise. And now this is how they seize. When there is not this, that does not come to be. When this ceases, that also ceases. That is, when lack of awareness ceases, mental activities cease. When mental activities cease, consciousness ceases. When consciousness ceases, mind and body cease. When mind and body cease, the sixth sense ceases. When the sixth sense ceases, contact ceases. When contact ceases, experience ceases. When experience ceases, wanting ceases. When wanting ceases, attachment ceases. It cannot be. When attachment ceases, the sense of self ceases. When the se sense of self ceases, renewed existence ceases. When renewed existence ceases, aging and death ceases and sorrow, sadness, trouble, depression, anxiety all cease. This is how this whole mass of trouble ceases. Then having understood this, the Awakened One let out this joyful revelation. Surely when the nature of things become clear to the devout meditating Brahmana, at that time all doubts vanish when one understands the breaking up of conditions. So how all of this whole chain is actually fabricated, it's just made up. These little sankharas, we're creating it. And that's what I was explaining on that retreat, was that a lot of the time we think that consciousness has all these activities in it, but actually consciousness is actually only activities. It's not uh, the activities are not within consciousness. It is consciousness that is fabricated through these activities. And when we, a person attains Nibbana, for example, the definition is Sabba Sankara Samatu. So that means all of these fabrications, they get tranquilized completely. So then there's no consciousness possible. There is only liberation. So, Bhante, um, is yes. that removing the sankharas, pretty much? Well, it's removing them, but it's removing them through wisdom and tranquilizing them, seeing uh, the unwholesome states of mind as uh, creating more agitation and disturbances, and dukkha, basically. And as we let go of those, there is only more and more liberation, and yes, so... And then the f when the, the chain, because it's not only like cut clear, like Niroda Samapati kind of thing. So it's when we actually, you know, work at tranquilizing these, these unwholesome states, we actually, we, we give less, a lot less power to the whole chain. So the, the, um, the, the Tanha, uh, the Tanha Upadana, uh, Bhava, Jati, all that is weakened greatly and so that manifests in weaker sankharas too because 
there's not a great sense of self there's not like so much preoccupation about like me myself and I all the time it's actually just light generous open so yeah let me uh, go back to my little window again on that occasion the awakened one sat in one posture for seven days experiencing the bliss of freedom then when the week had passed he emerged from this samadhi and in the last part of the night so it's the same he's not sitting seven <laughs> seven times in the row for seven days but it's just the same context and it's the same night basically so the first part of the night he contemplated the arising so you can just picture him you know like uh He's in the role of Samapati, basically, and he's like, he, he is, nobody actually attains the role of Samapati, but uh, <laughs> uh, because the, no, no self can, <laughs> can even go there. But coming out of it, he sees the, the, how the chain arises. He sees how, ah, oh, this consciousness is not eternal. It's not, it's not eternal, it's not everlasting, it's actually made up, it's fabricated, sankara, sankata. So he's just coming out and he's just seeing his own consciousness kind of firing up again and seeing like how this whole process happens and seeing in the second part of the night looking at the cessation aspect of it. And then understanding, yes, when these things in order, when, they, when there's not this, then that doesn't come. Then when there's not that, then that doesn't come. When then there's not that, when then that cannot be. And so he's just basically being a scientist, just on his own mind. And, uh, and this is the last part of the night where he's actually putting everything together and really understanding the whole thing. He emerged from this samadhi and in the last part of the night paid careful attention to the arising and the seizing of the chain of causality. When there is this, that comes to be. When this arises, there is the arising of that. When there is not this, that does not come to be. When this ceases, that also ceases. That is, Lack of discernment produces mental activities. Mental activities produce consciousness. Consciousness produces mind and body. Mind and body produce the six senses. The six senses produce contact. Contact produces experience. Experience produces wanting. Wanting produces attachment. Attachment produces a sense of self. The sense of self produces renewed existence. Renewed existence produces aging and death and the manifestation of sorrow, sadness, trouble, depression and anxiety. This is how this whole mass of trouble comes into being. With the complete calming and cessation of lacking awareness, mental activities cease. When mental activities cease, consciousness ceases. When consciousness ceases, mind and body cease. When mind and body cease, the sixth sense, the sixth senses cease. When the sixth senses cease, contact cease. It just cannot be. When contact ceases, experience ceases. When experience ceases, wanting ceases. When wanting ceases, attachment ceases. When attachment ceases, the sense of self ceases. When the sense of self ceases, renewed existence ceases. When renewed existence ceases, aging and death cease. And sorrow, sadness, trouble, depression and anxiety all cease. I think sometimes it's a little bit dark uh, to contemplate dependent origination, but um, like just this last line, how amazing is that, you know? when. Like you discover something that makes aging and death cease. How amazing is that? <laughs> and sorrow, sadness, trouble, depression, anxiety, all of that gone. 
Can you imagine a mind that never has to experience any of that? That's pretty good. Yes. <laughs> and <laughs> we don't say anything about happiness, but you know, like when all of that is gone, like what is left, you think? <laughs> such relief you know such and that was you know the um, a major theme that uh, that came back in the retreat is like when you know like why why do these we do these practices like these retreats and like deep practices and wow like so much relief that people are experiencing actually in their minds it's just amazing it's just their mind is just uplifted and happy then having understood this, the awakened one let out this joyful revelation and this is just the, the cherry on the cake. Surely when the nature of things become clear to the devoted that meditating Brahmana, one stands shattering death and its troops like the sun lighting up the sky. So here is the Buddha. Actually... Uh, becoming a Buddha. <laughs> so here's the end of my uh, translation and I will be uh, moving to the, the Vinaya. I mean we could speak a little bit about dependent origination but um, uh, since, since I'd like to cover a little bit more of the, the whole story behind it, behind the Buddha's awakening, I'm not going to drag into it but um, it's, be, it's so profound just to contemplate but really when you look at it simply it's simply a matter of like finding what is the support for the next thing and how these things arise together and how uh, when, when there's no more lacking of awareness of any kind when, when awareness has been just purified through just this letting go and upliftment of the mind wholesome states um, then these sankharas that arise, they are wholesome and they are very light. And so the whole chain that arises is, uh, of course, there's, there's a consciousness that arises, um, but that consciousness is not heavy. It's not very heavy. And so it's not super um, attached or uh, personalizing name and form as much as as it could be, uh, for example, because consciousness supports basically uh, nama rupa, this mind and body, uh, which I call mind and body. It's, it's translated in many different ways. Um, and then, and then, you know, with, without consciousness, there cannot be mind and body. It's like the Buddha says, it's like two two uh, two stacks of kusa grass that are laying on. Uh, leaning against each other if you take away one the other one falls you know so there cannot be body without consciousness and there cannot be consciousness without the body uh, without without this uh, unless you're someone is uh, arupa uh, the arupa realms but mainly this is uh, this is for uh, the, the rupa realm basically Otherwise, we wouldn't be talking about Nama Rupa. <laughs> um, and then, and then how, how could the sense even come into being? Like, if there's no Nama Rupa, like, this sense of, like, mind and matter, basically, this sense of uh, name and form, however we want to call it. The senses, they're, they're just basically rooted in that. They're, 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 they are nothing but that. So... Uh, and then from there, if there's no sense, there cannot be any sense contact. That's just pretty plain simple. Uh, so that makes a lot of sense. And then from contact, then that's where we have some kind of experience. And that's where, that's where really the crux of the, the chain is. Uh, whether what we're, what we're going to do with that experience will dictate what how the mind will become and what uh, if it will become heavier or lighter so basically and it's all conditioned even the path is conditioned we're conditioning our minds all the time uh, but hopefully in in a wholesome way in a way that's 
wholesome and um, uplifting and uh, beneficial for as many beings as possible. And which supports ourselves in the first place. So now I will be getting into um, So this was under the uh, on awakening. This is going for the Pabba Javagga, and now I will be talking. I will be reading from. Oh, this is the older translation from uh, I. B. Horner, um, and uh, she. Uh, I kind of like her translation actually, but uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I just have to organize my uh, it's, a, it's a bit of a new system here so uh, <laughs> okay oh so I can't do that so this is at the goat goat herds banyan tree now, at the beginning, we were under the, uh, the bow tree, the tree of awakening, and now he's under the goat herd's tree, the banyan tree. These crazy looking trees with so many roots that are going all over the place, and the branches look like roots, and the roots look like branches. So. <laughs> hey, but is that tree uh, still there? Is it, is it um, in good time? Mm. Actually, I don't think even I, uh, you know, even the Bodhi tree is not the the original one. The Bo yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But the location uh, and the yes, I I haven't inspected the whole area because uh, I saw the place where he was standing, looking at the tree for yeah. s for seven days, unflinching. Mm -hmm. uh, that I did saw, I did see. Um, but the banyan tree, I didn't see. Um, I mean, I think Bodh Gaya right now is very different <laughs> than what it was at that time, uh, from what I can tell anyways. Um, so, but I'm not a specialist either, so I, I would really have to, you know, uh, I really would have liked to go more actually to the temple uh, because I've only been teaching the retreat, so I haven't been able to, uh, to really get around and Maybe tomorrow, check out the cave where uh, he did all of his asceticism. Uh, but that's still up in the air. We don't know. So um, then, and she uses the the word Lord. So of of course, bear with me. Uh, then the Lord, having emerged from that contemplation at the end of seven days, approached the goat herd's banyan tree from the from the foot of the tree of awakening. So yeah, it's, it's gonna be a little bit uh, different here. So having approached, he sat cross-legged in one posture for seven days at the foot of the goat herd banyan, experiencing the bliss of freedom. Then a certain Brahmin of the, of the class uttering the word hum, om, approached the Lord Having approached, he exchanged greetings with the Lord, with the Blessed One. Having exchanged greetings of friendliness and courtesy, he stood at a respectful distance. As he was standing, that Brahmin spoke thus to, to the Blessed One. To what extent, good Gautama, does one become a Brahmin? And again, what are the things which make a Brahmin? Then the, the Blessed One, having understood this matter at that time, uttered this solemn utterance. That Brahmin who bars out evil things, not uttering the sound Om, with no impurity, curbed of self, master of the Vedas, who lives the Brahma faring, this is the Brahmin who may rightly speak the Brahma speech, who has no blemishes anywhere in the world. And then moving on to the Muchalinda tree. Then the Lord, 
the Blessed One at the end of seven days, having emerged from that contemplation, approached the Muchalinda tree from the foot of the goat herd's banyan tree. Having approached, he sat cross-legged in one posture for seven days at the foot of the Muchalinda, experiencing the bliss of freedom. Now at that time, a great storm arose out due arose out of due season. For seven days there was rainy weather, cold winds, and overcast skies. Then Muchalinda, the serpent king, I said the tree, Muchalinda tree. Oh, I guess it was Muchalinda's, Muchalinda's tree. <laughs> Muchalinda uh, snakes. Yes, uh, yes, well, yes. His tree. But they're actually uh, talking about a tree here, but uh, that's why I got confused. Then, okay. <laughs> yes, I'm just picking up with my, my own story here. <laughs> <laughs> then Muchalinda, the serpent king, having come forth from, from his own hunt, having encircled the Lord's body seven times with its coils, having spread a great hood over his head, stood saying, let no cold annoy the Lord, let no heat annoy the Blessed One, let, no, let not the, tu the, f the, the touch of flies, mosquitoes, wind and heat, or creeping things annoy the Blessed One. That's a pretty uh, serviceable snake, I would say, uh, pretty nice. Then Muchalinda, the Serpent King, at the end of those seven days, having known that the sky was clear and without a cloud, having unwound his, his coils from the Blessed One's body, having given up his own form and assumed a youth's form, stood in front of the Blessed One, honoring the Blessed One with joined palms. Then the Blessed One, having understood this matter at that time, uttered this solemn utterance. Happy is solitude, who glad at heart hath Dhamma learned and doth the vision see. Happy is the benignity towards the world which on no creature worked harm. Happy the absence of all lust. The ascent past and beyond the needs of sense desires. He who doth crush the, the great I am conceit, this truly this is happiness supreme. So he's uh, sharing with us a few glimpses of uh, what he's experiencing. And I guess um, in the past verse, I, uh, I could say that there is a whole chapter in the Dhammapada that talks about what the Buddha said that makes a real Brahmin because um, here being in India um, actually the, the caste system is still very alive even though it's it's kind of not but it but it still is in people's minds so uh, <laughs> people say it's not officially uh, active but it is really people think about it they know they know about it so and I had just some uh, discussions with the with some people about that, about their own caste and things like that. So, and here it's uh, really, uh, you know, you are born a Brahmin. So it's not something that you do. So that's why he's actually asking, like, what makes a Brahmin? What really is a Brahmin? Because in the, the usual tradition, you are born a Brahmin. You cannot, you cannot become a Brahmin. That's impossible. So. <laughs> And a Brahmin being like also a master of the Vedas and you know a, a Vedic priest or things like that, you could not just like become a Brahmin like that. It, you would have to be born in the right family, and it would have to be pure and all of that. So, uh, so that's why it's a it's a theme that comes back very often in the in the Dhammapada. There's a whole, and I think it's the biggest chapter actually, uh, the 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 Brahmanavaga, which is at the end, and it's the Buddha talking about what really makes a Brahmin, like a holy man, a holy woman, or a holy person, basically, not by birth, or by family, or by caste. Then the Rajayatana tree, 
Then the, the Blessed One at the end of, the, of seven days, having emerged from that contemplation, approached the Raja Yatana tree from the foot of the Muttalinda. See there. Having approached, he sat cross-legged in one posture for seven days at the foot of the Raja Yatana, experiencing the bliss of freedom. Now at that time, the merchants Tapusa and Bhallika were going along the high road from Ukkala to that district. Then a Devata, who was a blood relation of the merchants Tapusa and Balika, spoke thus to the merchants, My good fellows, this Blessed One, having just become wholly awakened, is staying in the foot, at the foot of the Raja Yatana tree. Go and serve that Blessed One with barley gruel and honey balls, and this will be a blessing and happiness for you for a long time. Then the merchants Tapusa and Balika, taking barley gruel and honey balls, approached the Blessed One. Having approached, having greeted the Blessed One, they stood at a respectful distance. As they were standing at a respectful distance, the merchants spoke thus to the Blessed One. Bhante, let the, let the Blessed One receive our barley gruel and honey balls, that this may be a blessing and happiness for us for a long time. Then it occurred to the Blessed One, truth finders do not receive with their hands. Now with what shall I receive the barley gruel and honey balls? Then the four great kings, knowing with their minds the reasoning of the Blessed One's mind, from the four quarters presented the Blessed One with four bowls made of rock crystal, saying, Let Bhante, let the, let the Blessed One receive the barley gruel and honey balls herein. The Blessed One received the, the barley gruel and honey balls in a new bowl made of rock crystal, and having received them, he partook of them. So that's uh, how the Buddha got his bowl, basically. Uh, supposedly from the four great kings of the four directions with uh, crystal, uh, rock crystal bowls and merging all of them into one so that he could add it, so that he could actually use just one. Then the merchants Tapusa and Balika, having found that the Blessed One had removed his hands from the bowl, having inclined their he heads towards the Lord's feet, spoke thus to the Lord, we, we Bhante are those going to the Blessed One for refuge and to the Dhamma. Let the Blessed One accept us as lay disciples gone for refuge for life from this day forth. Thus these came to be the first lay disciples in the world using the two word formula because there was not Sangha at that point. So, uh, they only went to refuge to the Buddha and the Dhamma. And uh, the Burmese say that Tapusa and Bhallika were Burmese. The Thais say they were Thais. So, <laughs> because the, it's, uh, it's understood that they were on their way to Su Suvarnabhumi, Suvarnabhumi uh, the Golden Land, which is Burma and Thailand. So basically, there's a little bit of a national argument here. <laughs> um, uh, Sri Lanka seems to stay clear out of that one because it's definitely in the north. <laughs> Thanks to the uh, yeah. distance between the ocean. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> There's other stories, but... <laughs> <laughs> yes, definitely. So, and then the invitation from the Brahma because the first thing that the Buddha realized was actually not necessarily to teach because his, what he discovered was so profound and so uh, hard to grasp for, 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 for a lot of people that he and his mind was really released like the last thing he would want to do is like try to cram things into his mind and like <laughs> try to like be something or like when you go beyond becoming then it's uh, it's not uh, really uh, 
to be expected that you would look for something to do really so <laughs> so somebody had to invite him and who better than Brahma himself so then the blessed one having emerged from that contemplation at the end of seven days approached the goat herds banyan tree from the foot of the Rajayatana having approached the, the blessed one stayed there at the foot of the goat herds banyan tree then as the blessed one was meditating in seclusion a reasoning arose in his mind thus this Dhamma one to be one to by me is deep difficult to see, difficult to understand, peaceful, excellent, beyond dialectic, subtle, intelligible to the, to the learned, to the learned. But this is a generation delighting in sensual pleasure, delighted by sensual pleasures, rejoicing in sensual pleasures, so that for a generation delighting in sensual pleasures, this were a matter, a matter difficult to see, that is to say, causal uprising by way of cause, dependent origination. This too were a matter very difficult to see, that is to say, the calming of all habitual tendencies, the renunciation of all attachments, the destruction of craving, Dispassion, stopping, nibbana, etang santang, etang panidang, garidang, sabbasangkara samato, sabupadi patinisago, tanha kayo, niro, uh, viraga nirodo nibbana. The classic definition of uh, nibbana, basically. And uh, here we find it very uh, close rooted in his awakening. And so if I were to teach Dhamma and others were not to understand me, this would be a weariness to me. This would be a vexation to me. I'm not sure he, if he would say a vexation, but uh, definitely more like a burden. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I don't think the Buddha would get vexed about something, but... Uh, <laughs> And further, these verses, not heard before in the past, occurred spontaneously to the Blessed One. This, that through many toils I've won, enough, why should I make it known? By folks with lust and hate consumed, this Dhamma is not understood. Leading on against the stream, subtle, deep, difficult to see, delicate, Unseen will be by patient slaves, cloaked in the in the murk of ignorance. In such wise, as the blessed one pondered, and his his mind inclined to little effort, and not to teach dhamma. Then it occurred to Brahma Sahampati, knowing with the mind, knowing with his mind the reasoning in the blessed one's mind. He thought, alas, the world is lost. Alas, the world is destroyed. Inasmuch in as the mind of the truth finder, the perfected one, the fully awakened one, inclines to little effort and not to teach Dhamma. Then, as a strong man might stretch, for, stretch forth his bent arm or might bend back his outstretched arm, even so did Brahma Sahampati, fi va vanishing from the Brahma world, became manifest before the Blessed One. Then Brahma Sahampati, having arranged his upper robe over one shoulder, having stooped his right knee to the ground, having saluted the Lord with joined palms, spoke thus to the Lord. Bhante, let the, let the Blessed One teach Dhamma. Let the welfarer teach Dhamma. There are beings with little dust in their eyes who, not hearing the Dhamma, are decaying. But if they are learners of Dhamma, they will grow. Thus spoke Brahma Sahampati, and having said this, he further spoke thus. 
there has appeared in Magadha before thee an unclean dhamma by impure minds devised. Open this door of deathlessness, let them hear dhamma awakened to by the stainless one. I have goosebumps just reading this, by the way. <laughs> it's just such an amazing uh, section. Uh, <laughs> um, I was going to say it's one of my favorite, but you already... Uh, <laughs> that's kind of getting old. It's obviously one of my favorite. Um, as on a crag, on the crest of a mountain standing, a man might watch the people far below. Even so do thou, O wisdom fair, ascending, O seer of all, the terraced heights of truth. Look down from grief released. Look down from grief released upon the peoples sunken, sunken in grief, oppressed by birth and old age. Arise, you hero, conqueror in battle, you freed from death. Man, leader of the caravan, walk the, walk the world over let the Blessed One teach Dhamma. They who learn will grow. When he had spoken thus, the Blessed One spoke thus to Brahma Sahampati. Brahma, it occurred to me this Dhamma penetrated by me is deep. And then he repeats the whole thing. And if I were to teach this and people would not understand, this would be troublesome. And further, Brahma, these verses not heard before in the past occurred spontaneously to me. This that through many toils I've won is not easy to see. And then again repeats the same thing. In such wise, Brahma, I, as I pondered, my mind inclined to little effort and not to teach the Dhamma. Then a second time did Brahma Sahampati speak thus to the Blessed One, Blessed One, let the Blessed One teach Dhamma. If they are learners of Dhamma, they will grow. Still repeating. And then a third time. So three times asking. Then the Blessed One, having understood Brahma's entreaty, and out of compassion from beings for beings surveyed the world with the eye of an awakened one as the blessed one was surveying the world he saw beings with little dust in their eyes with much dust in their eyes with acute faculties with dull faculties of good dispositions and bad dispositions docile or indocile few seeing fear and sins and the worlds beyond. Uh, so, few seeing fear and unwholesome actions, <laughs> and uh, and few seeing the world beyond. Basically, so that's relating to uh, the the uh, iriyotapa. Basically, the. Uh, this sense, this natural sense of uh, w this virtuous sense of a uh, wholesome sense of fear in doing wrong things. <laughs> and, uh, and he saw that few people, some people had this. And, and another wrong view uh, that is often uh, clung to is that there is no world after, there is no life after this one. So that some people did, did think that their actions matter. So that's why and the Buddha's teaching is all about karma. So uh, these, uh, that there wouldn't be another life after or that actions didn't matter at all, uh, then it would be a very nihilistic approach. And that is, uh, but he saw that there was some goodness. He saw that some people were intent on good, uh, even though they didn't always know how to do it, but <laughs> they still were intent on it. Even as in 
a pond of blue lotuses or in a pond of red lotuses or in a pond of white lotuses. A few blue or red or white lotuses are born in the water, grow in the water, do not arise above the water, but thrive while altogether immersed. And a few blue, red, or white lotuses are born in the water, grow in the water, and reach to the surface of the water. A few blue, or red, or white lotuses are born in the water, grow in the water, and stand up rising out of the water, undefiled by the water. And that's one of the most beautiful simile to imagine a Buddha, basically. If you do a uh, Buddha Nusati is like uh, like this this person who's just like transcended this world completely like a lotus like jutting out of the water kind of thing like not even touched by any kind of droplets of water he's just completely blooming above it <laughs> even though he came from that environment so that's quite quite beautiful even so, did the, the Blessed One surveying the world with the eye of an awakened one, seeing beings with little dust in their eyes and with much dust in their eyes. Uh, seeing Brahma Sahampati, he addressed him with verses. Open for those who hear are the doors to the deathless. Let them renounce let them show their faith, thinking of useless fatigue. I have not preached the, I have not preached Brahma, the sublime and excellent Dhamma to men. Then Brahma Sahampati, thinking the opportunity was made by me for the Blessed One to teach Dhamma, greeting the Blessed One, keeping his right side towards him, vanished then and there. So. And now, so he's wondering, uh, who will he teach to? Because, I mean, who's going to understand this? <laughs> uh, and he needs some good uh, first, uh, any good teacher needs some uh, really good first students uh, close by, and close core students, um, because that's just, uh, the way that the teaching shines, I think, is by um, uh, some people will be close and uh, understand that teaching quite quickly. And so, uh, and that tells a lot when. Um, Usually, the people that are that are actually experiencing uh, the teaching will be kind of like a, a kind of a testimony of of uh, of the teaching itself. So, even though he says he's fully awakened, uh, like it happens later, uh, not everybody believes him. So, <laughs> and so. Uh, so yeah, usually uh, some, some people with really good karma will be close by. Then it occurred to, okay, then it occurred to the Blessed One, now to whom should I first teach Dhamma? Who will understand this Dhamma quickly? Then it occurred to the Blessed One, indeed this Alara, the Kalama, is learned, experienced, wise, and for a long time, has had little dust in his eyes. Suppose, suppose I were to teach Dhamma first to Alara Kalama. He will understand this Dhamma quickly. So first he thinks about his two first teachers, which is another interesting point. He's not even thinking about the five ascetics first. He's thinking about his two first teachers, which taught him uh, the s some, the, well, this one in particular, the plane of nothingness. But then an invisible devata announced to the Lord, Bhante Alara Kalama passed away seven days ago, 
and the knowledge arose to the Blessed One that Alara Kalama had passed away seven days ago. And that's funny because a lot of the time the devas will tell the Buddha and ironically he's also thinking that at the same time. So there will be two lines. There will be the devatas told him and then, and then he had the knowledge also. So that's interesting, I always think. <laughs> then it occurred to the, the Blessed One, Alara the Kalama was a, of great intelligence if he had heard this Dhamma, he would have understood it quickly. And like Chandaratna Bhante was saying actually on this particular retreat, is that is said that Alara Kalama, well, technically uh, he, he was reborn in an Arupa Jhana. So he's actually, uh, you can't reach him. Like there's no sense base. There's no like, uh, anyways, that's what they say. Uh, there's still mind, so I guess he could maybe reach by mind but uh, so it's kind of like a, he's kind of like landlocked in his <laughs> amazing Arupa state <laughs> then mind it <laughs> yes mind luck the mind luck yes <laughs> yes yes <laughs> mind luck there we go good one <laughs> Then it occurred to the Blessed One, now to whom should I teach the Dhamma? Who will understand this Dhamma quickly? Then it occurred to the Blessed One, indeed this Uddaka, this Uddaka, Rama's son, Uddaka Ramaputta, is learned, experienced, wise, and for a long time has had little dust in his eyes. Suppose I were to teach Dhamma first to Uddaka, Uddaka Rama's son, he will understand this Dhamma quickly. But then an invisible Devata announced, oh, and it's invisible too, so it's a... <laughs> announced to the Blessed One, Bhante Udaka Rama's son passed away last night. And the knowledge arose to the, to the Lord that Udaka Rama's son had passed away last night. Then it occurred to the Blessed One, Udaka Rama's son, was of great intelligence. If he had heard this Dhamma, he would have understood it quickly. See, we see here like all kinds of really interesting karmic link with, with his previous teacher, like seven days he's passed and now he's just passed on last night. I mean, these are kind of like really kind of interesting coincidences of karma uh, that make him kind of uh, uh, put him in, in very speci special conditions again where uh, these great teachers are not there anymore. So, Then it occurred to the Lord, now to whom should I teach this, uh, this Dhamma? Who will understand this Dhamma quickly? Then it occurred to the Lord, that group of five monks who waited on me when I was self-resolute in striving were very helpful. Suppose I were to teach Dhamma first to the group of five monks. Then it occurred to the, to the Blessed One. But where is the group of five monks staying at present? Then the Blessed One with Deva vision, purified and surpassing that of men, saw the group of five monks staying near Benares at Izipatana in the Deer Park. This is where the previous retreat was held. Then the Lord, the Blessed One, having stayed at Uruvala for as long as he found suiting, set out on tour to Benares, so Baranasi. Upaka, a naked ascetic, saw the Blessed One going along the high road between Gaya and the Tree of Awakening. And seeing him, he spoke thus to the Blessed One. Your reverence, your sense faculties are quite pure, your complexion very bright, very clear. On account of whom have you, your reverence, gone forth? Or who is your teacher? Or whose Dhamma do you profess? When this had been said, the Blessed One addressed Upaka, the naked ascetic, in verses, Victorious over all, omniscient I, am I. Among all things undefiled, leaving all through death of craving freed, by knowing for myself whom should I follow? 
for my for me there is no teacher one like me does not exist in the world with its devas no one equals me for i am perfected in the world the teacher supreme am i i alone am all awakened become cool am i nibbana attained to turn the Dhamma wheel, I go to Kasi's city, beating the drum of the deathless in a world that's become blind. According to, the, to what you claim, Your Reverence, you ought to be victor of the unending, Upaka said. Like me, they are victors indeed, who have won the destruction of the cankers. Vanquished by me are evil things, Therefore am I, Upaka, a victor. Again, I have goosebumps reading the Beating the Drum of the Deathless. Uh, that's always something that kind of triggers me. Um, just being here also, just being so close to these places and um, picturing the Buddha. Like this is such a lion's roar that nobody's just kind of able to understand just yet you know so <laughs> like nobody's uh, still like not experienced dhamma enough to understand what he's talking about like he's just kind of out of his brains because he's basically talking about he doesn't have a teacher which is like almost like uh profany <laughs> at that time or something like that and it's uh because the teacher here is even like almost plays higher than 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 god itself because the teacher is the one who shows the way to god basically shows the way to to spiritual life to everything so the guru is like is like even more than than anything else so to say that one has discovered all this by himself and doesn't have a teacher is quite uh quite next level i would say <laughs> for the buddha when this had been said, Upaka, the naked ascetic, having said, It may be so, your reverence, having shaken his head, went off taking a different road. So, there you go. Uh, he's not really convinced. <laughs> and, you know, that, that, that just happens a lot. You know, we, that's why we have to be careful about the things we say when we experience, like, amazing things in meditation, you know, and things like that. It's not that everybody's gonna understand or like uh, can't say like a, well, of course, maybe we wouldn't say it like that, but <laughs> um, yeah, even like thinking like uh, about attainments and things like that, I'm thinking, uh, you know, uh, sometimes it has the, the reverse effect on people so like the buddha here didn't really gain a, a follower that's for sure <laughs> so <laughs> but he told the truth so yeah then the blessed one walking on tour in due course approached benares the deer park in isipatana the group of five monks the group of five monks saw the blessed one coming in the distance and seeing him they agreed amongst themselves saying your reverences, this recluse Gotama is, is coming. He lives in abundance. He is wavering in his striving. He has reverted to, a lay, to the life of abundance. He should neither be greeted nor stood up for, nor should his, should his bowl and robe be received. All the same, all the same a seat may, may be put out. He can sit down if he wants to. So they're not really happy to see him again. But as the Blessed One gradually approached this group of five monks, so the group of five, not adhering to their own agreement, having gone towards the Lord, having received his bowl and robe, one made ready a seat, one brought water for washing the feet, a footstool, a footstand, the Blessed One sat down on the seat and made ready, and the Blessed One, while he was sitting down, washed his feet. Further, they addressed the Blessed One by name, and with the epithet of your reverence. So even when seeing them, uh, his karma was just uh, too strong that uh, 
they couldn't uh, bear just not actually uh, greeting him. So, when this had been said, the Blessed One spoke thus to the group of, of five monks. Do not, monks, address a truth finder by name. And with the epithet, your reverence, a truth finder, monks, is a perfected one, a fully awakened one. Give here, monks. The deathless has been found. I instruct, I teach Dhamma, going along in accordance with what has been, enjo with what has been enjoined having soon realized here and now by your own direct knowledge that supreme goal of the Brahma fairing for the sake of, of which young men from a family rightly go forth from home into homelessness, you will abide in it. When this had been said, the group of five monks spoke thus to the Blessed One. But you, Reverend Gautama, did not come to a state of further men, to the eminence of truly Aryan vision and knowledge, by this conduct, by this course, by this practice of austerities. So how can now, how can you now come to a state of a further man, to the eminence of the truly Aryan vision of knowledge, when you live in abundance, are wavering and striving and having reverted to a life of abundance, so basically, how can you break through to awakening if you didn't even break through to awakening while you were almost dead trying and now you're just eating a little bit probably, like one meal a day. <laughs> and, and now how can you ever attain awakening like you're just like eating and you're like, I don't know, I don't know what else he was doing but uh, that's, I think that was probably just about it. Um, when this had been said, the Blessed One spoke thus to the group of five monks. A truth finder monks does not live in abundance. He does not waver in striving. He does not revert to a life of abundance. A truth finder monks is, perf is a perfected one, a fully awakened one. Give ear, monks. The deathless has been found. I instruct and I teach Dhamma. Going along in accordance with what has been enjoined, having soon realized here and now by your own direct knowledge that supreme goal of the Brahma fairing, for the sake of which young men of family rightly go forth from, from the home life to homelessness, you will abide in it. And the second time did the group of five monks speak again the same to the Lord. Then the Blessed One said, Do you allow, monks, that I have never spoken to you like this before? And now he's kind of like saying like, Okay, I'll just like draw some lines here. <laughs> you have not, Bhante. A truth finder, monks, is a perfected one, a fully awakened one. Give ear, you will abide in it. And the Lord was able to convince the group of five monks. Then the group of five monks listened to the, to the Blessed One, gave ear to Him, and aroused their minds for profound knowledge. Then the Blessed One addressed the group of five monks, saying, These two dead ends, monks, should not be followed by one who has gone forth. Which two? That is, that which is among sense pleasures, addiction to attractive sense pleasures, lo, of the villager, of the average man, un -Aryan, not connected with the goal, and that which is addiction to self-torment, ill, un -Aryan, not conducted, not connected with the goal. So basically, indulging in uh, engaging the mind and the senses all the time and finding a certain kind of relief from that but that's actually a double-edged sword or uh, self-torturing basically which was the tapas that the Jains were practicing at that time hmm. 
now monks, without adopting either of these two dead ends, there is a middle course fully awakened by the truth finder, making for vision, making for knowledge, which conduces to calming, to, to direct knowledge, to awakening, to Nibbana. And what monks is the middle course fully awakened to by the truth finder, making for vision, making for knowledge, which conduces to calming, direct knowledge, to awakening, to Nibbana. And here, um, this is the beginning of the Dhamma Chaka Pavatana Sutta, the turning of the wheel, basically. So he's convinced the ascetics, the five ascetics, and uh, he's delivering the first discourse of Dhamma that he will uh, deliver, and uh, which results in, uh, in that group of five to understand the Dhamma for the first time. And this I will be reading from my own translation, which you... It's a little tricky. Oh, not cooperating. There we go. Monks, by avoiding both these extremes, the truth finder has fully awakened to the middle path, which imparts vision and understanding, which leads to calm and goes beyond knowledge, to complete awakening and Nibbana. And what is this middle path? It is this eight-spoke path of the awakened, namely wise understanding, wise attitude, wise speech, wise behavior, wise livelihood, wise practice, wise awareness and wise meditation. This is the middle path that the truth finder has fully awakened to, which imparts vision and understanding, which leads to calm and goes beyond knowledge to complete awakening and Nibbana. Now monks, understanding what is troublesome is conducive to awakening, that is, because when we understand what is troublesome, then we can actually get rid of it. <laughs> Taking birth is troublesome. Aging is troublesome. Diseases are troublesome. Death is troublesome. Coming upon undesired things is troublesome. Being separated from desired things is troublesome. Not getting what one wants is troublesome. In brief, the five fabrics of the ego are indeed troublesome. What are the, ten, the five fabrics of the ego, the five aggregates? Just to see if you're following. Uh, being born, uh, uh, birth, uh, illness, uh, and uh, old age, sickness. Yeah. Yes. That's more like the, the result, the result of the five uh, fabrics, the five aggregate, the panchupadana kanda, kanda, the skandhas. Yes, the skanda, the body, uh, perception, feeling, uh, mental activities or formations and consciousness. So all these, the Buddha is saying, all these are troublesome. So then we learn to calm them down. I need to find myself again. There we go. Then monks understanding the cause of what is troublesome is conducive to awakening. That is discontent or thirst, this wanting, which, which is the very fuel for taking action, propelled by seeking happiness in always wanting seeking happiness and attachment in trifling material things, that is, wishing for sensory stimulation, wishing for things to happen, and wishing for things not to happen. Or this could be also 
said as uh, wishing to become someone or to become something in the future or wishing to not become anything that this whole thing stops and he's saying this uh, th these are just uh, agitating the mind and now the release from that the other the flip side of the Four Noble Truths the, the upside then monks understanding the release from what is troublesome is conducive to awakening that is the complete appeasement of re and release from that very discontent giving it up letting it go releasing it and unlatching from it then monks understanding the practice which leads to the release from what is troublesome is conducive to awakening that is this eight spoke path of the awakened which is wise understanding wise attitude wise speech wise behavior wise livelihood wise practice wise awareness and wise meditation when I realized this is troublesome I began to understand a Dhamma unheard before vision arose understanding arose discernment arose awareness arose and clarity arose and when I realized this truth is to be continually understood, I began to understand a Dhamma unheard before. Vision arose, understanding arose, discernment arose, awareness arose, and clarity arose. When I realized this truth is continually understood, now this was uh, uh, just acknowledging the truth and then understanding this has to be continuously understood and now he's seeing that it has been so now he's gaining quite quite a lot of uh, deeper understanding here about the four, first noble truth I began to understand a Dhamma unheard before then vision arose understanding arose discernment arose awareness arose and clarity arose when I realized this is the cause of what is troublesome, I began to understand the Dhamma unheard before. When I realized this truth is to be given up, hmm, now it changes, it shifts the perspective. Now he's realizing that's the cause, then the cause should be given up. That's what we need to do with it. So uh, suffering, that's what we want to do with it, is move out and away. So. Then his understanding that, his vision arose and his understanding deepened. When I realized this truth is given up, so to the present moment, now he's understanding it's not in him anymore. It has been given up. And see, we see the correlation here between the, the four understandings of the Aryas, the Four Noble Truths, uh, and Right Effort. How how he found these two actually together because he's explaining he's going through the four noble truths here but it's actually right effort so when we wise practice so that's how we came up with that because if he didn't see it in the present tense like fully abandoned in him then then he wouldn't be awakened <laughs> When I realized this is the release from what is troublesome, I began to understand the Dhamma unheard before. When I realized this truth is to be experienced, and so that's interesting. So now this, he sees this is the release from that very suffering, from the cause of the suffering and from the suffering, from the troublesome. And this truth is to be experienced. So we have to experience that. We have to experience the end of it. <laughs> so we have to experience joy and clarity that comes from mental development. So that's what this sutta is basically pointing to every step of the way. When I realize this truth is experienced, so now he's, he knows, like right now he's experiencing that. I began to understand the Dhamma unheard before. Vision arose, understanding arose, discernment arose, awareness arose, and clarity arose. When I realized this is the practice leading to the release of what is troublesome, I began to understand the Dhamma unheard before. When I realized this truth should be developed, 
Huh. Now it's going even one step further and pointing at the path and see how the four um, noble truths are so intimately connected with wise practice. Here is talking about, hey, this is the fourth noble truth. And that's what I love about this sutta is that it's really together, like the four noble truths, which is the deepest teaching of the Buddha, really, uh, with dependent origination. But dependent origination is in the four noble truths anyways. And also wise practice, which is uh, what we need to do. It's like the practical down-to-earth instructions. So the four noble truth is just the understanding, but then what do we do? And this sutta actually plugs it all together, where the Buddha puts the practice with the understanding. So when I realize this truth should be developed, then this is the path that we need to develop to actually experience the release from that troublesomeness in the mind. I began to understand a Dhamma unheard before. When I realized this truth is developed, so now he's talking about his own awaken, uh, awakening, I began to understand a Dhamma unheard before. Vision arose, understanding arose, discernment arose, awareness arose, and clarity arose. So long as my knowledge and direct experience of these four awakened understandings, as they truly are, each turning threefold, in these twelve modes, because there's four noble truths, there are three modes of them, uh, three, three ways, and just realizing what it is, what, it, what needs to be done with it, and to see that uh, fully accomplished in, in himself, basically. So as they truly are, each turning threefold in these twelve modes total, had not become clear, I did not declare having fully awakened with perfect unrivaled knowledge and understanding in this world of devas and maras and brahmas, this generation of samanas and brahmanas with its kings and people. But when my knowledge and direct experience of these four awakened understanding as they truly are, each turning threefold in these twelve modes finally became very clear and perfected, I declared having fully awakened with perfect unrivaled knowledge and understanding in this world of devas and maras and brahmas, this generation of samanas and brahmanas with its kings and people. Then direct knowledge and experience came. Unshakable is my liberation. This is the final birth. There is no more rebirth from now on. This is what the Awakened One said. Glad at heart, the group of five monks rejoiced in his words. And while this speech was given, the flawless, stainless vision of the Dhamma arose in the venerable Kondanya. He directly saw and understood whatever is of a nature to become, all of it is also of a nature to seize. Once the wheel of Dhamma was set turning by the Buddha, and this is it, this is the wheel turning now because Kandanya has understood. Uh, and he is the first one who will start turning the wheel, basically. The Earth Devas exclaimed that Varanasi in the Deer Park Sanctuary at Izipatana, the Awakened One has set rolling the wheel of Dhamma, which cannot be turned back by any Samana or Brahmana, any Deva or Mara or Brahma or anyone in this world. Then the Earth Devas having heard this celestial claim, the Devas of the Four Great Kings exclaimed the same thing. Then the 33, the group of 33 Devas, then the Yama Devas, the Tusita Devas, the Nimmana the Nimma Narati Devas, the Paranimita Vasavati Devas, and the Brahmic body of Devas exclaim, At Varanasi in Deer Park Sanctuary at Izipatana, the Awakened One has set rolling the wheel of Dhamma, which cannot be turned back by any Samana or Brahmana, 
any Deva or Mara or Brahma or anyone in this world. And at that time, and at that moment, in that instant, without delay, the news resounded all the way to the Brahmic plains. And this 10,000 world system shook, trembled, and quaked. And a measureless, illustrious radiance manifested in the world, surpassing even the radiance of the brightest devas. And the awakened ones spoke these inspired verses. Kondanya sees, Kondanya sees. And from then, the Venerable Kandanya came to be known as Kandanya, the one who sees. And so this closes the awakening of the Buddha from one tree to another experiencing the bliss of liberation. <laughs> And actually wording for the first time his, his understanding, his awakening. So I think we have a good picture. And you got to hear a little bit of a Thai in the background, so that's good. <laughs> On top of that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I just... The, the, uh, three, the three bun cake, um, is it like... The Buddha has the attainment, and then what's it? The three? Yes. Oh. Because there's twelve. Yes. Mm -hmm. Each of the four is broken in three, and so is it the attainment, and then doing the work, and then having the fruit. Mm -hmm. So basically, it's first of all, it's recognizing what it, what the actual truth is. Uh, at the very beginning whether it's hey this is troublesome or this is the cause of what is troublesome just that's just like the acknowledgement like just figuring out just that and then the second mode is uh, what to do with that what to do about it it's like there's there's a problem and then there's a solution kind of thing or there's like this is suffering or like this is troublesome this should be continually understood like this should be continually like this template should be continually applied basically to see and for us in the practice in direct meditation practice it's really awareness of body you know how to stay like always very conscious of how body reacts to things and uh, when when we experience these uh, uh, the tension we directly know, we directly know, that's how we can continually know this. So if, if as soon as there's tension, we can know, uh, this, is, this is troublesome. And then of course it goes deeper than that. But, um, and then the third one was uh, basically for him. So remember at the beginning he said, uh, as long as I did not see these things uh, like this, in these in this complete way in these three modes each completely 12 uh, I didn't claim to be awakened basically so he knew about these things and he kind of worked with it but uh, he as long as and that's the third mode as long as he did not see the completion of that in himself he didn't declare that he was awake so basically, first is to acknowledge, to recognize what that truth is. Second is to, okay, what do we do with this? What to do? The first one is to be continually aware of it. The second one is uh, to actually give it up, to give up the cause. The third one is to, um, to, experience, to experience the release so, because the third noble truth is the release or the cessation of what is troublesome. So, one has to experience that. So, that's what to do with that, that truth. And then, and then the fourth noble truth is the path. And that needs to be developed. And then the third mode for each of those is seeing that this was fully 
like perfectly done by him basically so and then he said I'm awake <laughs> does that does that answer <laughs> Yes, I was just um, making, seeing if there was a comparison between that and the, um, when, when somebody attains a certain um, understanding, a certain level, mm -hmm. and certain ones of the aggregates fall away, and mm -hmm. that then they have the attainment, but they don't necessarily have the fruit of it yet, because there's that place where they still need to um, and then, so I just wondered if that was kind of a um, another tie in like another layer that was part of what Buddha was saying that maybe I have so basically uh, Buddhas they have different their, their awakening is different like for us, uh, he's declared like uh, four levels of awakening, basically. But for Buddhas, there's no like stream entry, there's no... Because he's the first one to find it, so he has to completely figure it out on his own. So he doesn't get to hear the Dhamma and become a stream enterer, for example. So, so these levels of path and fruition, for him, they don't work because he's the first one. <laughs> So for him, there's like one path and one fruition. <laughs> is, is be basically being a bodhisattva and then being a Buddha. And that's it. But uh, if, if you uh, explain what a passe Buddha is, it might help Mahdi into understanding that also. Like a... Uh, Pachika Buddha. Pachika Buddha. Pachika. Yes, yes. Pachika yeah. Buddha. Yes. Well, it's just that there's different, different kinds of Buddhas and uh, a Buddha that can... a Buddha that can actually uh, teach. Like, they, they, Buddhas are all people that um, understand and break through to full awakening on their own. Uh, so, without the help of another Buddha, for example. Uh, but Pachika Buddhas, they... they they can only do it for themselves. They cannot teach. They only know enough for themselves, basically. So that they'll break through to awakening, but they won't know how to teach it. Or they might, but it's not going to be very elaborate. It's going to be like, yeah, just do it. <laughs> and that, that's not like super helpful. <laughs> so. And then there's some, uh, some Buddhas which do the same thing, but for them it takes a lot longer. Takes, that's what they say anyways, that's what the texts say. It takes eons and eons and eons of purification. And at some point, they break through to understanding by themselves and they have so much knowledge, they have so much wisdom accumulated because of what they've done, that when they take... Um, when they awaken, they've tried so many things that they know ev exactly how everything works, basically. So they're able to teach it really well and they know, like, they know it in and out kind of thing. So that's the difference between Pachika Buddha and a Samma Sambuddha. So. And there is even differences within inside the different Buddhas even. Even Samma some Buddhas were not all the same. At the beginning of the Pati Moka, for example, the Venerable uh, Mahamogalana or Venerable Sariputta asked uh, uh, Bhante uh, Bhagavan uh, why, why is there uh, some Buddhas that their sasana, their dispensation lasted very shortly and some lasted very long? And the Buddha says, well, those who didn't, didn't put down the Vinaya, didn't put down any Patimoka, their, their, uh, their teaching did not last very long. Uh, it didn't endure because there is nothing tying the teaching together. So it just, everybody kind of did their own thing and it got lost, basically. It got tainted really quickly and nothing to hold it together. Um, but, and in that definition, uh, well, that first, that means that 
it's quite different from one sasana to another. And our Buddha is said, Gautama Buddha is supposed to be a wisdom Buddha. So our Buddha is even even a special Buddha for for all Buddhas because he was very wise. He he did lay down a very good vinaya patimokkha, and that's why we have this. 2,600 years after. I mean, this is the reason why the teaching is still alive. It's, it's been transformed in many ways, but we still can access the core of it. So that's just amazing. And, uh, and just the way that uh, he was, that he acted, not all Buddhas did that. Like some Buddha would just stay in the forest and stay with like tigers and really like uh, really like uh, not conducive places for like lay people for example to go and you know learn the Dhamma or and even for monks you know even for monks it was scary so but but some of them were like really kind of uh, it reminds me of Dzogchen kind of thing like really intense uh, Himalayan practice like uh, of, like uh, like cutting through you know like all the fetters kind of thing <laughs> but uh yeah so even the buddhas are different so yeah but this story is quite uh yeah i get uh i get goosebumps every time i read it when i first stumble upon it in the in the mahavaga i was just so uh, impressed by how beautiful that story is and him going to beat the drum of the deathless and like the generation that's become blind and like so much gratitude it's just so much gratitude and um, yeah that that person was definitely amazing so <laughs> um, yeah so I hope that was enjoyable I'll give you a little bit it's so good to uh, hear the Dhamma Chakrabhata Sutta once again. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, very good. Well, maybe we can share some merits and then uh, yes, we, can, we can go our ways. Dukha patta chani dukha bhaya patta chani bhaya soka patta chani soka hontu sabbe ti pani no Idam me punyang sabbe satta anuhodhantu Sabba sampatti siddhya Aga satta cha bhumatta Deva naga mahidhika Punyang tang anumoditva Chirang rakhantu sambuddha sasana May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief May all beings share these merits that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty powers, share these merits of ours. May they long protect the Buddha Sasana. Sadhu Well, I wish you all the best. It was really good to see you all. <laughs> So lovely. Likewise, one thing. Yes. Thank you so much. Yes, let's Thank keep you. yes. Let's keep up to date. Let's see uh, what everyone is doing. Uh, slowly we're gonna start preparing for Canada pretty soon over here. So uh, I think there will be more uh, communications. And so uh, yeah, very good. Enjoy life. So one day we are, uh, as soon as you know, when you are coming to Bangalore, please let us know. Oh, yes, we yes, will yes. Also plan accordingly. Oh, very good, very good. That would be nice to catch you on the tour. Yes, but Yes, <laughs> very good. Ah, very good, very good. Terwan Saranai, nice take, take care, take care. Say hi to both, all of your family. So, so yes, okay. Bye, Marty. Terwan Saranai. Thank you.